endogenous refers to something that's naturally in there, like a protein that a cell makes for itself and the DNA that it has to make that protein naturally. Whereas exogenous refers to something extra that's added from the outside, such as say, if we put DNA instructions for making a protein into cells and get them to make it. Or it can be something like you ingest a pharmaceutical drug. That's not from your, your body's not making that itself. Instead, it's taken from the outside. It's exogenous. Um, and similarly, we can add things, if we're doing like cell culture, we can add things exogenously by adding chemicals to the media. So to the food, all that food that the cells are taking in, that's all exogenous. The cells aren't making them themselves. And so often when we're talking about endogenous and exogenous, it's because what we really care about is the endogenous stuff. We're caring about what the cells are naturally doing, but it's really hard to study that endogenous stuff, like just as it is because, well, it's doesn't have natural tracking devices and that sort of thing. So there are techniques that we can use, such as adding exogenous DNA, so we can add the instructions for making that protein exogenously. So we can add them, say, like on a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid. We can use a technique called transfection to get that plasmid into the cells and get those cells to make that protein for, for them, us. And we can make put a little bit of extra onto the end of it so that they'll make a version that has a tag on it, something maybe like a GFP, so a fluorescent protein so we could track it or a little epitope so something that an antibody will recognize and this is going to allow us to use techniques um, either to like stain it in cells or to break open the cells and then use a western blot um, so this technique that's going to recognize use antibodies to recognize that little bit um, and therefore we can then track and see where that protein was throughout the cell even if we don't have an antibody against the protein itself um, so by using this exogenous technology, we're able to do things that we wouldn't be able to do with those endogenous forms, but we're also making things more like artificial. When you're expressing something from like an exogenous source of DNA, you're changing the context that the cells are making that protein in. And so you're changing when those cells are making the protein because you're changing the regulatory information that's around the instructions for making the actual protein. So genes, the instructions for making proteins, they don't just have the instructions for actually putting together the amino acids. So putting together the chain of um, these protein letters to make the protein. They also have regulatory information. And that regulatory information is going to tell the cells when to um, when to transcribe the, the DNA. So they have like regions like promoters and enhancers that are going to direct the cells when to make RNA, messenger RNA copies of the DNA. And then those messenger RNA copies, they're gonna have the instructions for piecing together the amino acids, but they also have some regulatory regions, some like UTRs, the five prime and the three prime untranslated regions, which have more regulatory information. And so the cells are using this information in order to figure out when to make the protein um, and where and all of this various stuff. But when you're at it, when you're getting the cells to make a protein from this outside source, well, now you're lacking that context, contextual information unless you include like a bunch of region in front of the protein. Often what you're doing is you're in, you have like one of these like stock go-to promoters, something like a C CMB or various promoters that are kind of just like the cell, things that the cells will always express from. And so then you're all, like always getting the cells to make it or they have inducible promoters where you can get the cells to make it on demand. But in either of these cases, you're not, the cells aren't making the levels that they would normally make. And so sometimes you want to make sure that you are using a technique where you're not going to be over expressing the protein. Um, so getting the cells to make more than they would normally make. Although sometimes you want them to over express the protein because then you have more like signal, but you then you need to think about, okay, well, is that signal really relevant to what is normally happening endogenously in these cells or are these artificial conditions creating things happening in the cells that the cells wouldn't normally be doing. Now this isn't to dissuade you from using these techniques. Every technique has its pluses and its minuses. This is just a reminder that it's important to keep these things in mind when you're doing a technique, whenever the technique is, keep in mind the limitations, keep in mind how it relates to what you are actually interested in. Um, and is this giving you, what answers can this give you? What answers cannot, can this not give you? And then what controls can you do in order order to make sure that what you're seeing is actually relevant.
Often these techniques are used as kind of like the exogenous technology is used kind of like as a proof of concept or as a first first look. But then if you really, really, really want to show that something is happening, that something you're seeing is actually happening naturally, well then you need to look endogenously. There are techniques that we can use these days in order to study proteins endogenously, but still be able to track them better. So those tags are really handy in order to be able to track the proteins, in order to be able to pull out the proteins. Um, so maybe have beads that have an antibody against them, you can like pull them out, you can do all sorts of things if you could tag these proteins. But so what we can do is we can endogenously tag them. Basically with CRISPR, what you're doing is you're actually modifying the DNA in place. So what you can do is you can actually modify the gene, so the instructions for making that protein, you can add the instructions for making the tag onto the protein while it's still in that in that spot in the cell. Not nearly as easy as it sounds and you have always have to worry about like off-target effects um, like the CRISPR accidentally modifying something that's not what you think it was modifying um, but you can at least in theory add a tag onto the protein in its endogenous location. Now this could still there are still ways that this could interfere with the actual making of the protein so it's not quite like you have the actual pro like the normal natural protein being made but um if as long as you're not messing up too much um like with promoters and that sort of thing you should be then ex the cells will express that protein when they would normally make it um and as long as the tag doesn't interfere with um things that should be acting normally and so you have this endogenous tagging. If you have are expressing the protein that from an exogenous source of DNA, so if you're adding that DNA in, well sometimes now you still need to worry about what's actually happening to the endogenous protein that's still in there because now you have two versions of the protein. You have the protein that was naturally getting made, so the endogenous protein, and then you have the version that's coming from this that's being expressed from this exogenous DNA, but it's still something that the cells would normally make, at least the non-tagged version. Um, and so in order to kind of prevent the normal version from getting made, you can use techniques like CRISPR to actually just like knock out the natural version, or you can use techniques like RNA interference, where you add these short pieces of, D of RNA that are going to be used in this process. These pieces of RNA will then direct this RNAi machinery, this protein called EGO, which I studied in grad school, to go and shut down the production of the protein because this RNA is gonna serve as a guide to direct EGO to go and bind to the messenger RNA for the protein that you want to shut down. Um, and by shutting down the normal version of the protein, well, now you don't have to worry about there being two sources and now you're just measuring the, um, the version that you put in. You can also then control the levels of it you can see, okay, well, if it's knocked out, am I able to recover the activity? Um, am I like, do I make things normal again if I add it in from this exogenous source? Um, so that's another sort of, sort of like control and stuff you can use as well. So basically, endogenous is something that is what the cells normally have, what they normally make, what they normally do. So this can be proteins, can be a DNA, this can even be hormones and things that this, that's naturally in there. And exogenous is something that's kind of like artificially in there. So this can be a DNA that we add that a cell wouldn't normally have. It can be a drug that's that's added to the cells or that's ingested by someone. And all of these various things are things that the cells wouldn't normally have or they wouldn't normally be making at that time. So even if we stick something in there that the cells normally make, if we're adding it from an exogenous source, we're adding it, we're kind of like adding extra. So we could add exogenously add, say, a hormone that these cells normally have, but if it's not being made by those cells themselves, if it's not being made like what they would, they're wanting to make, it's like you give it to them, then it's not endogenous. And so I hope this helps you understand that distinction between endogenous and exogenous. Another term you might see is heterologous. We can talk about heterologous expression when we get, say, cells to make a protein that is from a different species. So often we're doing heterologous expression in bacteria because bacteria are really great for um, making lots of protein and allowing us to easily make lots of protein and pure 
purify that protein out. And so often what we do is we stick the instructions for making a protein into bacteria. We call this transformation. It's the same as transfection, except when we do it in bacteria, we call it transformation. So we can stick the instructions for making that protein into bacteria, get the bacteria to make a lot of it, um, and then purify out the protein. If we're adding something into the bacteria that is from like a human protein, so the instructions for making a human protein into the bacteria, well now this bacteria are going to be heterologously expressing it. Um, because they're expressing something, they're making this protein that they wouldn't, that is from a different species, so hetero different. Um, and so we have heterologous, and then we have endogenous, which is like the bacteria, what they would normally make, like all their own proteins and stuff. And then exogenous, so the DNA that we put into those bacteria is exogenous, but the expression is also heterologous because it's from a different species. So these are just different terms that we can use to refer to these various things. And then remember always, always, always that if something that you really care about is what's happening endogenously, we can use all these fancy techniques to do things exogenously, which make it easier to do experiments, say control the levels of those various things. Um, track those proteins at specific levels of hormones. But at the end of the day, you want to make sure that what you're seeing is actually physiologically or like bodily relevant. So that's where you need to then go back and make sure that things are actually happening endogenously too, but it can be easier to figure things out when you're dealing with these, um, with these fancier techniques.